And tell us about the, uh, the work that you do in the men's wellness space at the moment, mate. So I started running retreats for men around four years ago. It started with the idea of wanting to do a workshop. I'd just got in, well, I'd, I'd been training as a breathwork practitioner, but just to enhance my performance as an athlete. I never really planned on being a, a facilitator, a coach with that. And I was like, okay, let's, let's, I was, I was just noticing like, like habits and patterns in men that weren't super healthy. And I noticed them within myself when I, from when I was younger, a younger sportsman and I'd been through a bit of a change. So I'd like kind of been through this change in myself and I was like, I could still see these behaviors and it just wasn't, wasn't healthy. And obviously we just need to look at like uh, suicide rates and this kind of stuff. And there's, a, there's an issue, isn't there? So I was like, I wouldn't mind creating a, a, a day where we can kind of come together and do like breath work with surfing uh, meditation and just have like a bit, bit like a, a circle of the open discussion about like kind of like dropping dropping all the kind of bravado and just like what's going on what's what's coming up, what's going on for you like, and then it started with a day workshop it went it went really well and then thought it would be nice to to make it a bit more immersive do a bit of a retreat do a retreat and yeah we started with a three day retreat and uh, never really with I didn't really know where, where I want to go with it but the the transformations we were seeing through the guys was, was really powerful. So I thought this is this definitely needed. So yeah, just uh, and 16 retreats later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mate, they look so fucking good. I, I didn't know too much about you and then started researching and I've seen your retreats. I was fucking texting you, I think. And I was like, Mate, that is fucking cool. Thank they you. look amazing. They Appreciate genuinely it. look really fucking cool. Yeah, mate, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that in a little bit. I'm really keen to learn a little bit more about the ref work because mm. you mentioned that's kind of where it all started. And, yeah. and we've talked about, you know, we, we could talk about men's mental health a lot and suicide rates and everything else. And we kind of coach uh, sort of connection and, and community and, and exercise. And you obviously cover that to some degree as well, but we've not really covered breath work much. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. So I think like, like breath work is just um, controlling your, your breathing to get the acquired effect, you, you physical effect you'd want. So what I mean by that is the... The breath is the like, steering wheel for your nervous system. So you probably notice if when you're kind of like agitated, you're, someone's just like, whether you're in jujitsu or whether it's someone's just cut you up in the car, you notice your your breath's going to be kind of like the frequency is increased. So it's kind of a, it's an indication of where you're at in your nervous system. And then if, if you're, like, you're sleepy, you're, you're dozy, you're, you're, you're like, just chilling, your probably breath's going to be nice and slow. So obviously we know this, but it's not not something we think about using. So it's like, I can, I can actually use this tool to reach the acquired state so for me hey guys just letting you know that we recently launched our new everyday black belt membership on patreon this gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them you also get exclusive content as well as early ad free access to all of our episodes so if you love what we do don't spend 10 years getting a black belt for the price of a coffee a month get one now it helps us it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests yeah, I love the saying, um, your physiology affects your psychology. So by by using your breath, you can put your physiology in the acquired state. So it's, it's about kind of, okay, what does the environment need? Um, where am I at in, inside? And am I, is, is that matched? So you can use the breath to get you there. You can bring yourself up if you need to, you bring yourself down. Um, so obviously how, how that works is when you exhale, the, the heart slows down. So you inhale, the heart speeds up, you exhale, the heart slows down. So obviously just working with that uh, ratio. So obviously if I just wanted to breathe in for four and out for six, that's just gonna calm, that's gonna calm me down, lengthening the exhale, um, shorten the breathing frequency. So like I could like say to I think research shows three to seven breaths per minute. It like brings a balance to like the heart rate, uh, breathing frequency and um, a nervous system. So it's just about taking times to kind of check in and where you're at, where, where's the breath at and kind of like calm everything down. Obviously you, you can use it for like, Managing anxiety, uh, working for performance, like athletic performance, uh, aiding aiding with that because it's obviously something we don't really we, we don't really think about, but it's something that just by incorporating little things can like can can make a big difference. That's mad. So huh? it helped it helped me with uh, working with like I say arousal states pre competition. Um, it's funny in this world because you have to say arousal a lot. <laughs> but obviously, arousal just means like alertness, like readiness. We know that, like uh, how like energetic we have. Obviously, um, so like before a competition, I in my early twenties, before a game, I was like re I was really nervous. I I always used to think about 
having a having a bad game. I was like, I, I used to think like I don't want to have a bad game. But all I was kind of putting into my subconscious was bad game, bad game, worrying about not playing the week after. So everything I was just projecting everything into the future and the breath gives the ability to one, bring yourself back in, into the present moment. So I just kind of like it's just simple as like a box breath, like in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. That's just gonna bring me back into the body. And obviously we think about kind of like flow state. Obviously flow state definition is kind of when you're when the demands in the environment is matched by your resources so you can and even maybe just a bit more so your so your potential for growth but also then if you look at like brain states it's more kind of like, like alpha brain state wave states and that's more when you're like embodied uh, so obviously the breath can just bring can bring you the so it's doing that bring you in bring you into the present moment but also to it's obviously regulating yourself and what i think people don't realize about um these the uh, autonomic states so obviously kind of like deep parasympathetic which is more like like freeze um then you've got just like rest and digest then you've got fight or flight um these all have like a metabolic cost so obviously when you're sympathetic or fight or flight it doesn't have to be like right up there but it's a spectrum it's a spectrum you know and when you're up there obviously you, you're mobilizing it's mobilizing fuel so if you're i'm just sat there pre-game or pre jiu competition i'm like over breathing thinking about all the things that's going wrong because it's emotion so the emotion and stress affect the frequency of your breath um that I'm just going to be burning. I'm going to be burning through fuel. So I used to get out on the field uh, as an athlete, and I mean, on the training pitch, when there's not such a strong emotional attachment to a training session, like aerobically really fit, like uh, felt great for me. What I was like 115 kilos at the time, but like mobile, fast, and we get on the pitch. So five minutes, I'll be blowing, fully, fully blowing. And then like now, I kind of think back, and like, I think it's massively due to like the over breathing, because when obviously. CO2 is, is obviously it's a, it's a metabolic like waste product, but we need it. So when you when you breathe in, oxygen comes in uh, into the lungs, into the blood, attaches to the hemoglobin and goes around the blood. But it doesn't mean it's getting to the tissues to support output. Mm-hmm. So if I'm over breathing, I am um, I'm limiting the amount of like actual oxygen that can get released from the hemoglobin to to go to the tissues because I'm dumping all this CO2. It's also a vasodilator. So then you are kind of things have been a bit more restricted the brain's not getting adequate oxygen and then obviously the brain's what is it like two percent of our body weight but it requires like 18 to 20 percent of the oxygen so it loves oxygen so as soon as that's not getting enough oxygen we get anxious we don't we don't we don't feel good so there's all that go- there's all that going on as well so i went off on a bit of a tangent then but that's a, no, no, a few different yeah. ways kind of <laughs> like the breath's like kind of and if you know it's just if you don't pay attention to it you don't know you don't know what's like it could be affecting you like that yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was a great answer, mate. Great tangent. I think anybody listening might hopefully be locked in now to this conversation, which, uh, <laughs> which is cool. Um, it, it's funny because I think breath work is, it's, it's, it's almost like intuitive, isn't it? Because obviously we breathe, of course, but even today coming in, I was running around, doing the nursery run, getting caught up in traffic, getting really anxious. And I was thinking about this podcast and thinking, actually, what, 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 what would this guy probably do? And I'm like, right, okay. Deep breath out and, yeah. and start to relax. So I think so many people almost subconsciously probably do try and manipulate or manage their breathing in in a way but yeah. as you say i think not enough people know like really how to kind of control it and you know and, and kind of really leverage it yeah day to day i think it's the importance people don't realize the importance of it do they? yeah it's just something we could obviously we're the best one of the only things that's like both like autonomic but also like we can consciously control it um and like when i'm like say working on like sports teams or whatever i can see him looking at me and like is this can tell me how to breathe breathing, breathing <laughs> yeah. my whole life yeah. and yeah, especially yeah, rugby I'm, players yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, fuck off mate <laughs> exactly get out of your hippie um but you've also been eating your whole life you've been drinking your whole life it's a behavior the environment changes the way you breathe and if you don't pay attention to that and like fix it afterwards over time that will change the way you the mechanics the physics of, of your breathing yeah yeah it's just how it is yeah 100 percent um it'd be good to talk about i guess sort of the application to sport, um, specifically jujitsu, which we'll, we'll come on to. But I think before we get to that, I think just for like the everyday person, um, and again, we sort of already touched on men and, and men's mental health and, and how much of an issue it is at the moment. I mean, how can people like maybe apply that to their everyday life without, I guess, feeling a bit daft and, you know, getting into sort of some unusual breathing patterns out in public. I mean, what, 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 what's your advice to your everyday bloke who's maybe managing or, or struggling to manage their emotions and how can breath work play a part? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so 
It's a, it's a funny one because so many. I, I'm trying to take I'm trying to take the woo woo, and there's well, so few other people doing it as well. We're trying to take the woo woo away from breath work. It's yeah. like it's just your breath. Like, and there's a lot of research now to like to back up what what's going on. Um, so for me, it's like very small, very small. Like I was talking about like habit building, um, very small little things building them in. So I like to call like breathing breaks. So what? Uh, so people have been working with clients. So in the morning. Instead of like trying to get someone, okay, sit down and meditate for like 15, 20 minutes, because that, that's not that's not necessarily going to work for most people. The whole just the thought of meditation is kind of uh, and like and antagonizing in a way because the the they think they have to sit there and quiet the mind. Well, with, with the breathing, if you just if everyone's got five minutes, you can just get up five minutes earlier. You might have kids and you might have had a bad night's sleep. But if you just wake up in the morning. Um, just sit like lie down but like or if you're lying down put your knees up and you're just going to breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds for five minutes or even three minutes that's going to say like bring it'll slow your breathing rate down it'll uh, it'll slow the heart down your your breathing frequency will be more regulated and you're just going to feel calmer so then you're getting up you're starting you're not just waking up and then you just go okay what we've got kid run work boom 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 so you just you, you're having a break in between that and in that in that space you're able to kind of like sit with as well what's what's coming up in the body and the thing with emotion is it's so interesting because it's not it's not like a, a woo woo thing like it's just it's just a, such a natural thing for us and the breath gives you the ability to kind of if you're focusing on the breath you're also focusing on your internal environment and when you that's where the, obviously the emotions come from so if you can if you're able to just kind of sit focus on your breath and just pay attention to what's going on in the body and just like let it come and go and just be be okay with it then you, you're giving a chance to process those emotions instead of kind of going on your day, these things come up and I don't want to feel it. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna push it down. It's kind of break the stigma around the motion and like I'm like I used to hate any kind of um sad feel. I never used to like feeling sad. So sadness was like I don't like it so I'm gonna I'm gonna push it away. Where it's just a valid it's just a valid emotion. It just wants its kind of like space. So okay I'm gonna let it come in and let it come out. I'm, I'm not gonna like blunt it. Um and just taking so we can just take away the the woo around it, if we can explain an emotion for, for what it is so obviously the the brain gets like information from the environment it will it will pay attention to sensations and it will make a it will make an emotion out of out of the sensations to like drive action so that's what that's what's going that's what's all that's going on so it's like okay how can we how can we work work with this and just like just um yeah make it not a, a bad thing because i used to hate uh so any sort of vulnerability I'd associate yeah. with weakness. So I'd think that's weak, so I couldn't feel it. So it's just about kind of like allowing whatever's there, but not dwelling it, not becoming it. It's like you feel sad, it's okay, but you, you're experiencing sadness. It doesn't mean you're sad or like I'm, I'm experiencing anger. It doesn't mean like I'm an angry person. It's just something's come in, and you, but you've just kept hold of it a bit too tightly and you've not let it go through. Does it really benefit that? Do you do you get that feeling that it, that it helps with those sort of emotions, especially as men, like regulating that? 100%. Yeah, totally. Just like the, and just not getting frustrated with it. Yeah. You, you notice you're feeling a certain way, and it's just like it's fine. It's just it just is what it is. It's going to pass soon. Yeah. The other thing is as well is when you're talking about your breath work, are you talking about mouth breathing or nose breathing? Because I know you know people out there they struggle. You see the the mouth tape stuff at the moment and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I wonder what the fuck that was. I've seen so a that's of with their mouth yeah. Tape, so it's yeah. it's basically it's to force you to right. to breathe through your nose. And obviously, if you're an asthmatic or you struggle with hay fever or whatever, a lot of people are mouth breathers, especially if they they become overweight and all sorts of stuff yeah. and medical problems. So what what way would you say breathe? Is it to breathe anyway, or is it breathe through the nose and out through the mouth and what sort of stuff? It's a good question. Ideally, you breathe through your nose in and out at rest at all times. Yeah. Like ideally, and like you said, some people may have like issues and they might need surgery, you know, and then they might unfortunately might be forced to breathe through the mouth. But hopefully, they can get the appropriate like procedure to fix that. So, the mouth and the nose. If you look at like the kind of research, there's no real benefits to breathing through the mouth um, compared to the nose. So the nose, when it, when the airflow comes in, if you have been for a run and your lungs burn, and it's like. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we get exercise induced asthma, exercise induced bronchial constriction. I'm a chronic asthmatic, that's yeah. why I ask. So like I purposely try and breathe through my nose, but naturally, especially growing up, I, I would always be a mouth breather. Yeah. So the nose, as it, and as the airflow as it comes in, it humidifies the and, uh, and treats the air as it comes in before it, before it reaches the lungs, because uh, the lungs don't really like like stale and, and cold air, but obviously with the mouth. Uh, it just comes straight in and um, the nose harnesses something called nasal nitric oxide so uh, that pulls in the nasal sinuses 
uh, especially after like slow breathing and breath holds. So when that makes its way into the lungs, it's going to help redistribute the lungs, uh, redistribute the blood in the lungs and open up the airways. Um, obviously, it's a smaller hole, so it allows uh, less CO2 to, to come out, which obviously then allows the, the, um, the vessels to be a bit more constricted. So, and, and the list goes on, there's over like 30 like uses compared to mouth breathing. Obviously, as intensity increases during exercise, um, the air hunger builds and that feels almost like suffocation. So that's, a, that's just CO2 causing that kind of sensation in the, in, in the body and the brain. But we, it's about a slow adaptation. So to answer your question, uh, so I, I talk about breathing gears. So start nose, nose, intensity picks up. Okay, and the, kind of, do I have to go to nose, mouth? And then top end intensity, like, like creatine phosphate system, sprints, um, obviously it's mouth. And you don't even want to think about your breathing when you're yeah. in like the massive like heat of it. But as soon as there's a break, as soon as like there's a minute round, that's when you want to be, okay, how do I... Um, if if I'm gasping through the mouth, how do I go back to nose mouth, and then how do I go to nose? Is that what you concentrate on when you're yeah, doing it? So yes. say you're like gassed out, you think right, okay, I need to get back back to nose breathing. Exactly, because I know when I get there, I'm gonna I'm in a more like energetic, uh, efficient zone. I'm gonna be going back to using oxygen and fat as my main fuel source, opposed to like anaerobic. So that's what the breath can do for you. It can give you like that the chance to get back to that um, zone zone faster and obviously where you breathe matters as well so if you're if you're kind of like breathing through the mouth and you're seeing all this then that's called vertical breathing and then you start so the main muscles for your uh, respiratory muscles are the diaphragm and external intercostals um but if you start to breathe into your upper chest you start to breathe from a higher lung volume you will start to recruit all these muscles because you're breathing into here now and breathing has become labored so to assist you you start to recruit all these secondary breathing muscles that are in your chest back shoulders and that that requires energy so then the nervous system and brain is okay breathing's become quite labored now so what it'll do is it will shorten the breathing frequency to compensate but then we've got a gas exchange issue there because each breath you take a small amount of airflow gets lost on the way to the lungs so you're over breathing each breath you take you lose her so you're limiting the amount of oxygen you can get to to the lungs to the blood to support output so yeah it's uh there's a lot going on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. fascinating yeah. though isn't it it's fascinating because i never think of it you know, I don't know about you, but I, I rarely think about. I just try and control my breathing rather than thinking better about. Than, better not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. I think jujitsu is massive. But even when I used to box a little bit, like often my coach would say they tell you to get your hands up up here to like yeah, open yeah. the space. And I, I, I was always coached to breathe in from my nose and out from my mouth, and that was how I recovered my breathing. But it was there was never then a transition or a progression then into mm. to in and out through the nose. So that was quite interesting to hear. Yeah. It's weird, yeah, it's interesting like boxing over sports. They've kind of known, but they don't know why. Yeah. If that makes sense. They so know bits, don't they? they know you always bits. know they they know a snippet, yeah. don't they? So obviously I know if it knows mouth better than mouth mouth. Let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah. But like obviously if you can get back to the nose nose line, then obviously that's where that's where we want to be. Mm. But it takes time, it takes adaptation, it'll take two months to get so I could probably do on a walk bike session like 95% nasal, but then put me in a rugby situation. So many different variables going on, even even jujitsu. Um, there's too much going on. I don't want to be thinking about my breathing if kind of, if I'm if someone's like aggressively trying to pass me guard. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like, okay, where's my breathing? Freak? Where's my what's my breathing cadence at now? It's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But as soon as like say that I'm I'm uh, say like this one's got me in a half guard, and I'm kind of trying to pass. That's when I can I can like start to as long as it's got to be weight distributed on them I can take a minute I'm, I'm going to start slowing it down I'm listening to them and if I can hear that and I can put more pressure on and I know they've not got long because this this there's going there's going to gas out and all the while I'm kind of shifting states to one more um, conducive uh, to obviously using oxygen and fat and the other the other thing with that is you got to think what's going on in in the brain so if a uh, if I can stay more cognitively sound under kind of like the highest stressful situations, I'm going to make better decisions opposed to them. Where if they're like kind of more like fear driven, like amygdala is, is running the show, their impulse control, their rational thinking is compromised. So um, there's, there's that side of things as well. That, that just like adds a whole new level to Jiu Jitsu now, mate. Do you know, Darren made, me, <laughs> Darren made me really aware of that when I first started. So, was, uh, so when I was um, like getting on top or get, trying to, I don't know, trying to put a lot of pressure through, he used to go, you change your breathing, so I know what's coming. Yeah. And I was like, what? And he was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. change your breathing. So when I was like, and then and that's always stuck with me though. So now before I'm like, you know, going to go into mount from side control or something like that, before I do it, I make sure like I'm fairly calm with my breathing because what I used to do is be like, right, well, I used to be thinking about it, right, I want to try and go mount now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. but he knew, know it's coming. And he used to say, you got to fucking get out of that. He said, because 
yeah, you, you're never going to fucking do it. You know, yeah, I'm just going to, I can read you. Yeah, I find with jiu-jitsu, certainly like defensively, if I'm stuck in like a compromised position, there's certainly like a choke, but it's not quite cinched, but it's, you're stuck. That's typically when I find I apply sort of breath work most, where I'm just thinking, right, I've got to keep like, the blood off <laughs> going to the brain. So I'm just going to like really yeah, control my breathing yeah, nice. and just settle down in these situations. But one thing I've never thought about doing is, as you touch, touch on it then, is actually kind of being mindful of my opponent's breathing and using that to almost dictate my pace and my actions. That was quite interesting. Is yeah. that something you do quite a lot when you're rolling? Yeah, because obviously it's what I do for a living. They do yeah. Yeah, like, I got you. So like, I'm like, and I, I want some depends how nice I feel. It depends how experienced they are. If they're, like, if they're, if they're better than me, I won't tell them. But if it's like a white belt, I'll tell them. I'll say like, look, they just slow that breathing down a second. But I feel like it's purple belt. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you gas out. <laughs> yeah, mate, it's fascinating. I, I, I think my breathing is going to be all over the place today when we train later. Because I've got to be really mindful of yeah, it. Yeah, do you know what I was thinking? That I was thinking, fuck's sake. I'll my breathing. <laughs> I'll hold my breath and now I'm fucked. <laughs> There's one more thing that's interesting on the on, on the breathing side of things with, uh, with exercise. So breathing doesn't necessarily change linear, linearly as you, as you exercise. So there's a, a there's an initial increase in the so you can kind of call it like vent ventilatory uh, compensation points. And so obviously you start, uh, the heart starts to obviously speed faster to get extra blood oxygen around the, the body, which is great. That's probably the most efficient we are. And then that, that's good, that's aerobic. And, but then as soon as intensity increases, like then obviously CO2 uh, builds, we then pull a deeper breath to get better, like alve alveoli ventilation, um, which is great. But then as soon as kind of intensity increases more, breathing frequency, it, just, it kind of jumps up because of the the air hunger and like the the, neg the negative affect associated with with air hunger and CO two. So then we're breathing okay, and the next thing, as soon as that increase happens, and that's when you start to dump too much CO two, you over breathe, and obviously if the if the respiratory muscles are fatigue, they will then whatever muscles are working if you're running. So it's called the respiratory metabolic reflex. So if you're if you're doing a five k, uh, let's say so say twenty k, and you're trying to get your best time. Um, and you, you die from starts fatigue because you've been over breathing at rest. And as soon as you start to exercise, breathing doesn't just become good, does it? So then you'll over breathe and breathing's poor during performance. Once the diaphragm fatigue, starts to fatigue, the brain notices and it goes, okay, which muscles are using requiring the most oxygen and blood? So what it does, it, it constricts those muscles and, and reverts blood flow back to, to spot the diaphragm. Obviously this leads to like early onset fatigue um, to the working muscles. So that's just something uh, to, bear, to bear in mind as well. So we're trying to, Try to stay in that zone before ventilation spikes. So trying to so if you can kind of build up the intensity you can do through nasal breathing, then you're able to kind of like high, uh, handle higher intensities through the nose. And it's just more efficient. So that's what we're kind of trying to do. Trying to the real the real kind of uh, bread and butter I'd say is like trying to increase aerobic threshold with it by like slower nasal breathing because it's just a lot more efficient. But it takes time. Like the average person just can't go and do that because they're just that breathing through the nose early doors, like you said at the start, it's too much for them. So that's why I think a lot of people give up because they'll start, I can't do the same pace I was doing nose to mouth because they've not adapted. Once they've adapted, it'll be even better uh, to some, uh, and a low intensity anyway. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the, the longer term sort of physiological effects of, of breath work and breathing. And as you were talking, I was wondering if you can strengthen your, your breathing muscles. And is that how you would do it through that sort of just that practicing of, of, of the sort of nasal breathing as you train and progressing that? 100%. And so I think almost like if you can fix your breathing at rest, like uh, your breathing's going to be better during performance. So then that's going to pull back the point where the respiratory muscles start to fatigue. So that's obviously prevention better than cure kind of thing. But then, yeah, so you've probably seen the masks, the uh, the sports masks. Yeah, I've literally written down training masks. I was going to ask you about yeah. that as well. So they're, all, they're, 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 they're good. So obviously, they're definitely, if you put them on, you'll definitely feel yeah. that your diaphragm contracting the external into extracostals moving. But the the best thing is you've probably seen the little breathing devices because mm -hmm. they add more resistance than the breathing mask. So it, you need the uh, one of the guys, the recent breath science courses I did, a guy called Martin McPhilly. He, he told me you need at least 50% of like the diaphragm's like max capacity um, of output to to train it because it needed like uh, it's very it it's very um, very fast to it the, 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 the diaphragm so it, it needs that it needs that kind of uh, tough resistance to, to work so yeah through like uh, breath hold work through um, the face mask and then if you can get like things one good like aerofit if you can get those and kind of like do 
on the inhale, like work on the inhale, it definitely it definitely prolong that point where mm. they the start to fatigue, just like working any muscle. Course. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So I think the um, the elevation training mast I think came from MMA years ago, from mm. what I remember, and it was there was a there was a fight team I can't remember which that were training up in Big Bear, I think, in, in the US up in the mountains. So when they came down to sea level to compete, they obviously could manage their oxygen levels very well. So guys that were training down at sea level started training literally in like gas masks to try yeah, and yeah. basically mimic like that altitude training. Yeah. And then they kind of refined it to these little like elevation training masks. And I had the mark two years ago that I used to run around <laughs> gyms and look like an absolute bell end. Um, but it was a good conversation starter. Um, I'm assuming that that sort of short term use of like restricted breathing isn't going to have the same benefits as training at altitude though, right? Or does it? So I'm not, I'm not, not going to say it's, it's the same because it's quite, it's quite, it's quite a minefield. Um, but it definitely can mimic it. It can't. So obviously what you're working with is hypoxia, isn't it? And as soon as like SpO2 drops below 90%, um, like 89%, we become hypoxic. Obviously intermittent hypoxic training has been shown to mimic um, mimic altitude training. So you can you can do it on, on land. And so what hap what happens is obviously it's hypoxic. So the body's like, okay, we need to create adaptation. So what it does, it primes the primes the kidneys and the and the spleen to release uh, extra red blood cells. So obviously extra red blood extra extra red blood cells, extra hemoglobin, extra oxygen carrying capacity. So um, but with the spleen, it reabsorbs after after around after around an hour. So you, you kind of need to, if you, the longer you do it, then the, the bone marrow gets primed to release it, to release even more. So it's <laughs> kind of, you'd need to do it. I think there's a, a good, a good paper. It's quite gnarly. It's quite a gnarly protocol, to be honest. It's a eight second apnea, 16 seconds uh, rest. Uh, I think it's eight, six or eight um, reps, uh, a couple of minutes recovery, and then another two or three uh, from memory. And that's that was a couple of times a week for four weeks, and then they, sh they did show there was um, there was definitely increase in in increase in hem hemoglobin count, and there the person obviously increased the lac lac lactate threshold as well, because like, obviously yeah. you're working, you go in a lac you go in lactic, aren't you? Because you know, you're not breathing, so you you start to uh, create a buffering capacity towards a lac uh, uh, for, to, for your lactic zone when when you do that kind of training. So yeah, that's uh, so it's absolutely mental and all that sort of stuff. You have to stay on it though. Yeah, it, it, it will. If you, so, if you lean up to a comp, you do it. But then, if you if you leave it, it will it will go back. What was it? What was it? Lance used to do when he uh, didn't he used to like store his blood and then yeah, transfer so his blood to have so he EPO. had like, more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's fucking yeah, mental. That's isn't cheating, it? though, Danny. You can't yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So obviously, I'm not saying it was effective as as a Lancey boy no. putting big bags of blood in, but it's like a smaller scale. Yeah. So it's EPO or referral protein, and that's kind of what it was. That's what he's doing. That's what uh, that's what primes the body to to mm. release more red blood cells. So yeah, that, that's kind of what we're doing. So if it, it's it's good to work lean into a comp, so you want to do it two, three times a week, depending on your stress levels and where you're at, because it's it's stressful. Um, and then yeah, but it will re it will reabsorb and yeah. And w would that would that have like a similar effect to like a Tabata workout where you're creating that sort of oxygen deficit through working beyond your VO two max? Do you still get the same adaptation, or is it is it different because obviously you're restricting? Yeah, you won't be going high pox. The thing is, when, when you're not kind of doing any deliberate CO2 tolerance work or breath hold works, the harder you work, the harder you breathe. So you're just dumping the CO2. So like, it's not, you don't have, obviously you have increased levels of CO2 because of the metabolic activity, but your breathing, fre breathing frequency increases. So you're dumping it. So obviously when you hold your breath, then you're exposing yourself to it. That's where the, that's where the adaptation comes from. Yeah, I got you. Okay, I've seen you doing a, a bit of work in pools and the water holding yeah. weights, and yeah. and it sounds like that's that's I guess another way of doing that type of training, then, right? Yeah, it is. But in terms, uh, obviously, in terms of protocol, we we because I've got a few people, I probably don't have them in there enough. Do you know what I mean? There's enough rest time to, to work to work. So you got okay, you got to be in apnea for this long rest period, and then repeat. I'd say the pool stuff. Uh, it's something really, it's something I really enjoy. Something really, really passionate about. I went over and trained in America last year with uh, an organization out, out there. And I'd say with that, that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm my kind of interest is have more heavily at the moment is, is, in, is in stress, working with stress. And with with that, you're creating a container, a stressful container. Um, and the reason why is, well, just to take a step back, obviously the societal um, kind of 
the 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 cultural kind of uh, association with stress is that it's a it's a bad it's a bad thing like avoid stress at all costs when stress is no good no bad it's, it's impartial it's just it's just the, the response of the body to the man's placed upon it that's that's all it is and how you perceive a stressor directly affects how we respond to stress so if you if um if it's like a challenge, if you perceive something as a challenge, like okay, I've got this, it's going to be tough, but I, I can, I've got the resources to to match it. You physiologically respond different, so you become more focused, more like honed in, more motivated. Where you you stay vasodilated, you obviously blood flow to the brain, to the muscles, opposed to if something's happening, and you know, like, I can't, I can't deal with this, I can't do it. So you're going to become more withdrawn, more more constricted, more fearful. So it really is with stress. It really is how. Um, so you have a stressor, you have an appraisal, and you have a response. So that appraisal is where we can really work with the stress. So with the, with the pool, we are putting people in this environment and giving an opportunity to kind of sit with the stress and perform a task, whatever it is, under the water, whilst using obviously that that, uh, that, that like positive self talk to kind of like tell them that, that tell themselves they're okay, and then you kind of build. Um, you build resilience with that and you get to see yourself in like a sympathetic state okay this is what I'm in this state now I'm not here for long but this is what I this is what happens to me when I'm stressed and then you get to develop that relationship with yourself and each time you do it you become a bit more a bit more capable a bit more a bit more resilient mm. so yeah something really something I'm really interested in yeah no it's, it's fascinating mate and I think you, you you mentioned something earlier was it physiology leads to psychology is it, that what you said it dictates it doesn't dictates affect, it affects it yeah, physiology affects psychology. Yeah, and this is the thing because I think you know, there's when you, when you think about stress and, and anxiety and emotion, you know, you, you've talked already a lot about the the sort of physiological changes of that, but people often just think it's in their head, right? Yeah. But it sounds like with a lot of work that you do, you're almost kind of tackling both components. So it's managing that head talk. Yeah. And, and kind of understanding like where your mind goes in that space, mm-hmm. and then also feeling that the changes in the body as well. Um, I've, I've heard you talk about medi- medi- uh, meditation. And that is something that sounds quite worthy to a lot of people. Um, but also I feel like it's something that's not very well understood because often when I think about meditation, for me, that's kind of like quiet space, allowing my thoughts to wander um, and just let them just do, go about their business and, and just kind of almost processing. But some other people I speak to feel like it should be an ability to completely clear your mind of any thought. Like what, what does meditation mean to you? I think it's different to... Uh of a peer, of a, to individuals, but if you look at like all the different traditions, like Buddhism, uh, all the different Eastern kind of forms of meditation, it all boils down to kind of uh, the same thing, the same thing really. And if you could, if you can clear your mind, brilliant. But I, I, don't, I don't, for me, that's not the point. Like you said, it's, it's. I don't, I don't want to sit there and and just like go with ev- go with every thought. I, I want to sit behind it. So meditation for me is the ability, almost like kind of like clouds pass through like an open sky, is to be like that. My awareness is like that, like vast open sky, and the clouds can come past. So there might be a thought, it might be an emotion, but I allow it to come in and out. I don't kind of, I don't, um, I don't even push it. So we do two things: we either push it away because we don't want to feel it, or we hold on to it and we we base our, our identity around it. So for me, meditation is the ability to be able to create like a subject object relationship between. The thing that is a were because like you say like, i had a thought i i, I had an emotion like, um well, well who, who's the, who's the i like so i'm i'm looking at this microphone now obviously i'm not a microphone it's something it's something that i i can see i i observe it's the same with an internal experience as well you can see a thought you can see an emotion it's not who you are it's just something you can observe so the more you can kind of create that space the less power and control emotion has over you because you give it the you actually give the kind of obviously the frontal lobes time to process uh, like whatever it is like whatever kind of like maybe a stressor or if you can create space from it that's one of the best ways to kind of process it so yeah it's the ability to sit and like be with whatever's coming up within you but don't uh, don't identify don't hold on to it just let it come in and out yeah i feel like and that's the that's part of my people won't do it because they feel like they have to clear the mind well I, I don't think that's the case obviously if you live in the himalayas and you're going to go meditate every day <laughs> but you want to be able to live in the world and like deal with what life has to throw at you the stresses and you'll be able to like sit with it and like you respond better because you're not so driven by these kind of instinctual uh, powers you know yeah it sounds like a really good like coping mechanism basically yeah and i think you, you kind of mentioned uh something there about you know kind of your thoughts on you know you shouldn't hold on to them and i think that's another reason that people maybe don't meditate is because they maybe feel like their thoughts define them and although they're, you know, kind of fleeting, sometimes, you know, things pop into our, our heads at times, right? And we're like, oh, 
probably shouldn't mention that to anybody <laughs> and i think sometimes people like almost think bad of themselves because of those thoughts but i think that's normal right to have just these fleeting odd thoughts that just come and go like you say yeah and don't judge and don't judge that i think that's the biggest part so you sat there that's why the breath's really uh powerful because if you like then maybe just did a, did a box or a high triangle is a nice breath i like to do uh, it's like a five ten five it's that 10 second hold you're just kind of like quite still it's paying attention to the heartbeat um but if you can if you can kind of be the counting that and then next thing you you you, you might as well then you think about what you're having for breakfast um so i used to do that. i used to get pissed off that's that's kind of intuitive so now when it happens like okay no, i've just realized that okay I've, i went with that thought i've like, I, I just like it took me for a little then you just bring yourself back to the breath to the to whatever it is you're focusing on um but without judging so don't like get frustrated with yourself for for having those thoughts just come back each time you you go missing again come back and it's just that's what you do it's just in just like re repetition over time and then you build you build that focus and concentration over time of it i've found i'm still working on it yeah 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 <laughs> um and we've talked a lot about i guess the sort of short-term benefits of breath work um what are the kind of research like long-term benefits to kind of health is is there anything so I think if, uh, say, we're going to look at burnout, say we're going to look at like chronic, we're going to look at chronic fatigue. Um, so before, you, the, what I have with chronic fatigue is is, uh, is like obviously long, like, like I said, stress isn't good, good not bad. Um, it's context specific. So, if, but if you're living in, if you're living in, in a state of stress without adequate rest, then it's a pro then it's a problem. But at the same time, no stress is a problem because then you just you're not motivated. You're not. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to get any get up and go. You need that, like adrenaline that gets released with stress. Adrenaline is a, it's it's a catalyst for movement. It wants you to take action. So like we need it. So the breath can give you the the ability to like notice where you where you're at in your in your states, and then like then bring yourself into one states that are more associated with growth and repair. Because when when you're stre when you're stressed, all, all you all you focus on is like action and mobilization. So the breath can kind of like give you um, more like an intuitive gauge of, of where you're at and it can like, over the long term stop you from like going to like chronic fatigue and burnout. Obviously it can help with like improve sleep. So it's more, it's more like, it's more something you need to just build in, something you need to do day to day to kind of manage your state to stop like long-term effects. So, so obviously we know like the long-term effects of stress, so obviously it's catastrophic. We just start to like, we start to break down obviously cardiovascular issues etc et um like aut autoimmune so like the breath can kind of like you can just stop that in its tracks by um making sure you're getting in between this the the, the like the ex exertion that we want that you're bringing yourself down because for me resilience isn't just the, i think we've got like a perception of resilience it's just keep going how much can you just keep taking but the ability to come back down and like uh, to a place where you prioritize the resources is gonna is gonna have a massive correlation with how well you can go again. So uh, it's just kind of like gives you the ability to teeter between like states, so you can so you don't just burn the candle at both ends. So I'd say that's kind of the main thing with long term. The breath can it's more of a preventative yeah. measure. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah, awesome. And and how about its application with things like sleep? Do you find it um, is is useful there? Yeah, massively. Massively. So there's a few, like we mentioned before, you said like uh, top down. So there's two ways you kind of like work with stress, work with the body. And it's, uh, it's, it's so you got top down control, obviously using like thoughts and like positive self-talk. Uh, and then you've got bottom up, which is like obviously the breath, movement, uh, like massage, these these kind of things. So with sleep for me, so the, the nervous system really likes uh, familiarity. So when say you're an athlete and you're traveling and so for example you might want to bring like an eye mask you might laugh but i i sleep with the mouth tape on i have a little bit because i've got a big neck so like i'll i nasal breathe during the day but for some reason i go to bed i'm like <sighs> like i don't snore but well you say you sleep with that hostage tape stuff on yeah but, just yeah, just yeah. a little yeah, bit i think yeah. people think you're like wrapping your head <laughs> but it's just like a tiny little square because yeah. you will notice the difference i notice the difference now i wake up with dry mouth i don't feel great if i've uh, not used it but anyway so the nervous system loves familiarity so when it only when the nervous system um, predicts safety, does it then start to shift? Okay, you're safe to sleep. There's not there's no predators around. So by creating a routine, 
So it might be like a little bit of like gentle movement before bed, a certain scent, re reading a book, obviously dim lights, just from a certain time you start to implement this routine. That is gonna put the nervous system in a state which is like, it feels like ready to kind of shift, to, to go down. And obviously it's almost like counting sheep, but obviously with the breath, you just want to do like a five in, five out, or like the high triangle, like I mentioned, five in, 10 hold, five out is a really good one because it's like an anchor for the mind. So it's two things, it's shifting gears, it allows you, it puts you in a state more conducive to sleep, but also it gives you an anchor for the mind. So you're not just thinking about, I can't sleep. Instead of thinking I can't sleep, toss and turn, if you just kind of like stay with a certain breathing cadence for a while, it's gonna, the chance are it's gonna drift off because you've not been um, getting stressed about not sleeping. So that's mm -hmm. it, two ways. So building like routine and like, uh, yeah, different protocols to anchor the mind, taking it away from the fall of, what time is it now? I don't know, I've got this much sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so when you do your breath work, then do you, are you literally just counting your head or do you use a physical timer? Like what, what's the best way for people to actually manage the, the duration of their breaths? I think counting it in yeah. your head because that's part of it. That's the, that's an anchor. Yeah. You know, if you can, if you can kind of like, just say we're gonna go breathing for six and out for eight. Um, then like when you're, you, so you've, you've, you're counting the breath, but you're also kind of focusing where's the breath. Okay, is it going here or I'm breathing in? You don't just want to breathe into the belly, so people belly breathing like that, like that's not actually great. Just just the belly all, all over the time, like pelvic floor health. Um, but like we're talking like ribs and lower back, so you think you want to think with, so you could be breathing in through the nose nice and slowly, and you you want to imagine that everything's expanding three hundred and sixty degrees, so like back. So there's a lot of a lot of room in this posterior section of the ribcage for expansion, but because if we've kind of like developed this like upper chest breathing pattern, you know we're going to be a bit like this. So it's about like we have to really like set it all down so then we can take like a full abdominal breath. Um, so you're thinking on where the breath's coming in. You're, you're following this journey, you're counting. So you're doing all these things that's distracting the mind because that, that's meditation essentially. It's kind of creating a focal point for your mind so you can kind of be still and like uh, the thoughts will come in and out around that. Uh, but yeah, just count, counting it and it, people will find the different ones that, that, that work for them. Obviously, lengthening the exhales is going to make you feel calmer, but you might just want to kind of feel balanced. So it might be the five five. Um, obviously, there's lots of different stuff, performance style stuff. You can do like breath hold work on the bikes, and mm -hmm. um, it's just finding what do you need, what like okay, what do you actually need, and like uh, then there'll be like a certain breathing cadence to, mm -hmm. to to support that. Yeah, awesome. I remember as a kid, I, I would practice like breath holding under like the water, like in the pools with my mates. I was in on in holiday like two well, weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, I was, I was, I was getting to count me. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done it for years. I mean, I don't know if this is uh, kind of within your gift to say, but is that something you want to actively be encouraging like kids to do is maybe not underwater necessarily, but, <laughs> but like practicing like holding their breath and, and creating that tolerance from a young age? Um. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, it's right. Because like, I think because of stuff like I don't have TikTok. You see someone on TikTok and like, I've got a son, he's 14 and he was telling me some like technique he saw on, on TikTok. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> um, like the the hyperventilation into a breath hold, like especially before cold water is like terrible. Yeah. It's detriment, like, it, it increases risk of, like, of a heart attack, um, decreases blood flow to the brain. So does the cold. So if you're doing it by yourself, massive chance of you passing out shallow water blackout yeah, yeah. so there's all this stuff that's going on that we need to that we need to address like the issue is like unless you've done it from like a research stamp like standpoint the breath work feel, uh, feels unregulated mm -hmm. and people just do anything you know what i mean like leading also this breath work that you can do which like elicits like psychedelic experiences and kind of like um, like it helps like release trauma and stuff well i don't want to say that um it kind of like helps release kind of like stored emotion like um, like be emotionally cathartic and it's quite dangerous it's quite dangerous as well if not done in the right set set and setting so there's a lot, a lot of cowboys in there in in the, in the space that, that that's for sure um but to, to of like the, to go back to your your question i think kind of just like teaching the, the fundamentals like nasal breathing mm -hmm. you know because they will build up a bit of a natural co2 tolerance just from nasal breathing especially if they do it during exercise because uh, if you if you're used to doing mouth breathing during exercise just by doing that same or trying to do that same output through the nose, it's going to increase CO two tolerance. Mm. Um, so that would be a good that would be a good place to start and like just work on the mechanics. Worthy really breathing. This this kind of stuff's better than breath holds. Late, is later down the line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, it's something like we say we do naturally though, isn't it? We 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 mess we mess about with it as long as you can you can play as long as you got like the spotter, you got someone where you got, you, got some, <laughs> and you don't hyperventilate before. Um, 
breath holds. It's really safe ish, obviously, don't have any heart conditions, and I don't push it too far. I'd never go past like an eight, nine out of 10. But if people are just experimenting with it, just don't hyperventilate because the the sensation of air hunger and the discomfort that CO2 is going to like elicit is very hard. It's very hard. Like, you're not if you're measuring SpO2, like, you have to do, you have to be serious, kind of like psycho to pass out. Just from an hour, just from holding your breath, it's too. I'm not challenging anyone. No one, no one, no one, try me on this. <laughs> but it's very hard. So like, it only becomes um, an issue when you hyperventilate. You dump all your CO2, mm. and you obviously your oxygen's. It's not necessarily higher. I think there's a misconception around like you hyperoxygenating your your body is not necessarily the case. Um, so you've got high oxygen, you've got low CO2. So when normally when oxygen drops and CO2 rises, you get this really massive urge to breathe and it's really hard to hold your breath but that's been uh, that's been compromised so it's like down here so it's rising really slowly so you don't need to hold your breath but the oxygen is dropping and it drops lower um, than 50% your, your chance of passing out so, so when you <laughs> hyperventilate it, it, it like it basically takes away that evolutionary alarm that's telling you to breathe so that's where, that's where we see the issues with like people drowning doing the Wim Hof breathing and stuff like that so when they when people are like going under the water and they're just doing those you know those deep dives and they've just got nothing and they how do they, how do they improve that is it just fr through practice oh you mean like the um you know like travis castro the free divers yeah you know yeah, what i mean like he'll just go underwater and you'll just be able to hold his breath for x amount of time how, how do they how do they improve that is that just through lung capacity or is it specific training for that it's both they're like yeah they train the train lung capacity but like the, I don't, I don't even know what they do with yeah. the doing the doing all stuff with the diaphragm. I don't yeah. really know to be honest. That's but crazy, isn't it? They're training themselves to like the body to become more efficient with really low oxygen as well. So they actually they've created adaptation for that. So yeah, there's, there's that going on as well. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating yeah. though, isn't it? It's fascinating. I always think oh, I think fucking hell. There's like... there's a mechanism in the body. I think it's called the dive reflex. Yes, we uh, we've played around with it at uni. Where um, if you literally if you put your face in water. Mm -hmm you're like your physiology just slows down like everything starts just dialing down just through like the fear that you've fallen over into water and you're unconscious mm. and it's just like a life preservation thing so yeah. all your vital functions just ease off just to try and just draw as much out of the oxygen <laughs> that you've got in your system it's fascinating how the body works mate yeah mainly yeah, yeah. reflex isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. really interesting um, we obviously touched on jujitsu a little bit earlier and obviously hicks and gracie is obviously well known for his breath work mm. And you see him doing all this stuff with his stomach. And you kind of mentioned a second ago about how um, just doing like stomach breathing isn't necessarily longer term good for you. But what did you make of all that sort of breath work that, that sort of the Gracies were famous for? Well, but like so stomach, stomach breathing, like, it's obviously it's better than upper chest breathing. But what I'm saying is it's, a, it's better to focus on the whole yeah. than just the belly. So ribs, ribs lower back, but so all, all of it, obviously. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting because these like these guys these guys knew and like with what they with what they did you can't you can't um, you, you can't you can't question it can you I actually don't know what what they they might he might have been working on his on his diaphragm like working with his diaphragm which is obviously really helpful so it might have been kind of like diaphragmatic control um, with his breath I, obviously I've read I've read brief but he doesn't really talk too much about uh, about breath work I've seen the doing kind of um, like the like the the fat the fast breaths, uh, which, like, is is if you, as long as you're gonna do if you're gonna put a bit of like a little bit of a breath hold at the end of it to allow CO two to build to build back up, it, it, it's I suppose it's okay to kind of uh, get you in like an upregulated state because it will upregulate if you're feeling like flat and like you just you've not you've got no get up and going yet. Doing so okay, I'm gonna do I'm not gonna do shallow upper chest, but I'm gonna do like. <laughs> Like a full deep breath, you'll notice within five breaths, you're gonna be like, you'll notice like the tingles in the in the body. You start like you develop a little bit of a stress response. Um, as long as you hold your breath out, like a little bit of a breath hold allows CO two to build up. It's 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 okay. Um, but if you just do, if you're just doing that, and then my thing is, how are you breathing after that? Are you still kind of like breathing a little bit through the mouth? Uh, are you still limiting the amount of oxygen you can that can be released from the hemoglobin to support output? But he must, he must have, you know, he's like, he's one of the goats, isn't he? So I really don't want to, <laughs> I really don't want, I really don't want to say, but he, he looks, he looked like, he looked like kind of almost like more like, like the yogic style where they're really kind of like, like experimenting with, uh, yeah, with the diaphragm and stuff. I don't, I don't, I actually don't know. Yeah. 
It is fascinating. And I, th I think with a lot of this stuff, there's no definitive right answer, is there? Yeah. It's, it's people's different interpretations on the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think as obviously we develop, science comes into it. But again, it works for certain yeah, people exactly. and, and it may not work for, for others. Yeah. Do you work with many um, sort of jiu-jitsu athletes or anything at the moment? Sort of from a, from a breath coaching perspective? But I've done little bits with uh, Owen, Owen O'Flanagan, a little bit with him, just talking through some stuff. Um, there's like a little bit of a presentation on, on things and I'm working with um, a, is it a UFC fighter leading up to the, the Manchester, is it, uh, is it, is it Moby Modi? Is it Lithuania? I can't think of it, can't pronounce his second name, Lithu Lithuanian guy. <laughs> um, he's British, but he's like a Lithuanian heritage. <laughs> I'm working with him at the minute and that, and that was that, that, that was interesting because I spoke to him and he used to do like the Wim Hof breathing before his like his like last UFC fight and he and he said that he he felt a bit like a bit a bit gassy like uh, early, early on early on in the rounds and I, I just said like so look like like I just said then I said if you want to upregulate a little bit using that that I said that's fine but you just got to be conscious of um, where your breathing's been at before then have you been unconsciously hyperventilating because you because the emotion is driving that. So if you're already doing that, if CO2 is low, then you're going to go purposefully go into some hyperventilation. Then you don't actively do like a small breath hold to allow CO2 build up. You go into the fight with a limited oxygen carrying capacity. Like so, the hemoglobin, sorry, the oxygen is going to stick to the hemoglobin and just come come back out. It's not going to get to the t or it will to a degree, obviously, but it's not going to be a, not not a optimal for performance. So I'm I'm, work, I'm I've been working here just on just small just small things about that. Um, I've been there little, little bits, yeah. yeah. I, I enjoy. I work with like with a few Olympic athletes as well, and it's all super basic stuff. It's just mm. stuff that like they can protocols to kind of fit in and around the chest. So maybe could could like in the warm up because I I don't want to give them extra stuff to do when they've got like a Olympic program to to, to do. So it's like, like in your warm up, can you maybe throw some um, increased intensity at nasally? Build a bit of nasal adaptation. Can we throw a few breath holds in there to do a bit of CO two tolerance work, which is going to kind of like, if when once you adapt to that, it's going to slow your breathing frequency down. Um, and yeah, can we do some practices like thirty minutes before you compete, some visualization stuff like bring yourself in, in into into your body, like that, that kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Do with athletes. Yeah. And how's how's that been received? By the athletes, have they said it's benefited them? Have they have they said oh, I don't really feel it? Yeah. What's that? Also, what's that buy in? Do they like? You know, they kind of buying into yeah. like breath work as a benefit, or is it still a bit like? Mm. Yeah, I think I think I think you just tell if you tell if someone struggles with with pre competition anxiety, they're gonna they're gonna listen. Yeah, yeah, true. they're gonna like oh, I'll do it, I'll do anything. And think how many people do suffer with that, even at even at a low level. Yeah. You know, imagine like being an athlete; yeah, it must be fucking like. We all know a guy in the gym who, who's a killer in the gym, but on the competition mat, they just flake. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, they will they will buy in if if they think it's gonna. So I, I, obviously, I, I, top end athletes are always looking for that one percent. Yeah, as you know. So if they think this is gonna remotely help them, if they feel like, okay, the, this anxiousness is uh, affecting my performance, and um, then they're gonna listen. And so it's a mixture of the breath and kind of the mind, the mindset is kind of stuff. So it's how can you shift your perspective to these and these nerves I'm feeling? So they probably think, okay, this is going to inhibit my performance how can you actually shift perspective to think i need this i need these nerves these nerves are going to assist and enhance my performance so if you can allow them to get that shift and uh, then they can it it becomes less of something this like icky feeling that they don't like so something okay this is something i need and i can utilize this to enhance performance so it's using that using that shift with it as well yeah that's really cool yeah, absolutely fascinating i think it? so many people would benefit it seems such a not a simple thing but you know we all just breathe and we don't really think about it so to be able to control that and manipulate it to benefit yourself is is fucking mind-blowing really isn't it yeah you know 100 percent mentioned wim hoff a couple of times and that was obviously well he he kind of made it kind of almost quite mainstream i think breath work originally i might be mistaken so correct me if i'm wrong but i'm sure it was wim hoff who said that he could control his immune system through breath work was that him that said that oh, yeah making that up. it sounds like somebody would say yeah what, what do you make of those sort of claims <laughs> so what what, what are, you, are you talking about the study that they did i think so yeah yeah, yeah. so what happened was they he he so he did it himself but he was like no we need a bigger sample uh sample group because obviously it's not it's not enough um, just, just by yourself so they think they had six, 12 or 16 people like he, he did his thing with him I don't know what he, they did they did the cold stuff and then 
they did the breathing and then they got injected with a um, what was it an endotoxin I think that's right yeah, yeah. And, and based and and they didn't get there was no um, kind of like immune immune response from it apparently uh, and so what what they reckon and what people have broke it down they think that because they because of the uh, the, the, the hyperventilation start breathing elicits a stress elicits a stress response. It's gonna it's gonna release cortisol or see adrenaline and noradrenaline. And so they reckon these kind of chemicals are the things that fought off the the, the end. Of, that's what that's what they reckon. That's what they reckon. So they think that maybe they're putting the body at such a high stress all the time that when they do get an infection or they get some problem, they it's able to fight it off faster. Is that the thinking behind it? I'm not quite sure, but obviously cortisol is like is like anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And it's like, it, it, one of the reasons it gets released is because if something's happening, you're bleeding out, it's to kind of like a limit, like stop a like infection and things like that. So you reckon that might have, have, have been, yeah, that's when it's been dissected, but they don't, they're not saying that they're saying, oh, we can just control it. We can just, with, with, our, with our own mind. But obviously <laughs> Wim, Hof, Wim Hof's an amazing guy himself, but I do, I do question the whole Wim Hof movement. Um, but at the same time, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you guys if it wasn't for him off because he put like breath work in such like a uh, in, in into the into the masses. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think we need to understand like the fundamentals of it before we just start hyperventilating. Because if you're stressed, if you're like on teetering like fatigue, um, fatigue like chronic stress, and you yeah. start hype, it feel nice. For, it feel nice short term, but long term, you just put in a, you put in like an acute stressor on top of a lot of other stresses. Mm -hmm. You need to be focusing more like down regulation, more more recovery focused. And then then you can add it into if, if it feels good for you. But it's, it's not something I use as, as, a, as a modality. Yeah. All right, now fair one. <laughs> uh, let's chat about your retreats a little bit because we said at the, the top of the podcast, but they, they look awesome, mate. And one of the things that I, I was looking on the website last night ahead of this, and obviously you do some locally in Devon and Cornwall, mm. but you do some out in Scandinavia as well. And there's yeah. one, I think, in January in Sweden <laughs> yeah. that you've got, yeah. uh, which I'm really tempted by, by the way, so I'm going to chat to you offline about it. Um, but one of the things that you, I, I noticed and we've just kind of mentioned, but it's the cold water stuff. Mm. So kind of how does like how does that benefit sort of the, the sort of ice cold water submersion? It's, uh, so obviously for people in, in going to like going to kind of like the Nordics and getting in like a throat well it's not actually a lake is it it's 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 the Baltic Sea but obviously it's an archipelago so it like weaves its way in. Mate, uh, <laughs> even just thinking about it, I'm like, <laughs> I have a cold shower the other day, mate. I thought I was gonna fucking die. <laughs> <laughs> but ex exactly that, I think so for people. Uh, people to come it's a big like challenge for them yeah. it's like okay i'm gonna go it's like it's almost like a once in a lifetime trip for some people i'm gonna go i'm gonna get in that like the frozen ocean the frozen baltic and the sense of like achievement they get from from doing it is is massive um obviously you look at like the physiological benefits of, of the cold as well um but it's more of like so it's a it's like talking about stress and stuff it's a container isn't it of like you get that's going to elicit a, a stress response like heavily um but it's an opportunity for you to get in there can you can you use the mind to kind of can control the body like you say use that top-down control if you can sit in a in with it these like the rush of chemicals that's getting released and the kind of keep you cool you're training yourself to do that in a real life situation when when, when shit hits the fan so that's what you're doing but it's just also it's really it's really fun as well obviously a big increase of dopamine makes makes you feel good it's sustainable in terms of there's not a big crash af after it um because you get immune you get immune response with that uh increase like good for your circulation there's a lot there's a lot going on but it's just it's just really it's just really fun and going to sweden doing it with everyone else like you encourage yeah. each other uh, the camaraderie there's no ego i think it's like in the in the kind of like cold water world there can be a bit of ego people are staying for too long but it's not about that once you've once you've done a certain amount of time in the cold the rest of it's you kind of just you might either doing it for yourself as a challenge or you're doing it for your ego mm -hmm. so like, you, you, got, you got to keep it safe you know where it's, where, where it's already kind of a bit of a as long as no one's got any cardiac issues it is relatively safe um it just looks really extreme if people went to say they were going to come to Sweden do a retreat, would you suggest to them to do a little bit of cold water stuff before they come out? Or <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking in my head then, like I'd be that twat who just jump in, never really done it before, and just die of an heart attack. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's just too fucking. <laughs> would you Would you say like try it a little bit at home and and, and get used to it before you come out to yeah. something that freezing? Yeah. So you 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 get more robust to the cold shock response, so you get more. Um, prepared to like th that, that shock, but you never really get um, you never you never really 
you too experienced all the other effects that happen in the but that's going to happen whether you like it or not mm-hmm. but you you improve how you deal with it so in terms of you get in and like it's gonna it's gonna take your breath away you get better at kind of regulating yourself so that that's why it's important obviously when one of the reasons i can't tell people to go in an exhale is if you go in on like an exhale when you because you get a gas reflex which is obviously going to happen whether you like it or not but if you go in on full lungs the chance of like, you like panic style breathing is going to be increased and then if you start to panic obviously then that's where shock comes in and that, that's the bad side of it but if you can get in there control you obviously you control your breathing um and then obviously you shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic in there it becomes a restorative practice so yeah definitely better practice working on like how that just how that is for you how do you respond to it and then obviously Shit. working on that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's fascinating how how different people respond to it I've, I've not done any any proper sort of cold plunges or anything but i used to do a lot of obstacle course races I did one locally called Rock Solid and it was um, up in Exmouth, I think. And it was like early March and it was, there was lots of in and out of natural water. So it was nice. fucking freezing. It was so cold. And I remember there were sections on that. I was, I was able to tolerate the water quite well. I didn't like it at all, but I mean, just physically, I wasn't shaking too much. I was able to kind of yeah, sustain it. it yeah. Whereas other people were like shivering wrecks. Yeah, Even yeah. after the event, I think my mate made the mistake of jumping straight into a hot shower, Yeah, but he started getting a hypothermic so yeah, yeah. he was really struggling and it was just mental just seeing the wide array of, of different people's reactions yeah like what what is that is that like fitness is it just exposure is it tolerance why do you think people have such different reactions to it obviously mass makes a difference and like body fat as, as, okay. a, as well so if, you, if you're more muscular if you got a bit more yeah if you got a bit more to you um that that you're going to be a bit more well you say that but then you know, see skinny people just doing it for for ages but like on average, obviously, like a bigger person is going to have a bit of a better tolerance, and that's speci- uh, specifically lean mass. Yeah, well, yeah, well, not necessarily, not necessarily, just like generally increased mass, opposed to someone like with like low BMI, okay, really low. Um, yeah, like expo- exposure, you you build you build the tolerance. So obviously, you one of the things that happens is you activate uh, something called like brown adipose tissue. You might use the brown fat, mm. and that you 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 become better at heating yourself up. So this, this, you probably notice like babies don't shiver because you've got this brown fat units around like the, around the heart, like the chest area around the, the back of the neck and that, that, uh, that gets activated and that starts to use white fat into as thermogenesis to heat itself up. So you, you basically, and then uh, you activate more and then you become better at warming up essentially. So that over time, the more you do it, you, bec- you, like, you build your internal, internal furnace. I'm, mate, I'm fucking fascinated with this because it's so it's so in depth. And actually, you're free in January, mate. Yeah, well, I'll be keen. <laughs> I'll be fucking keen. I'll be crying, but I'll be keen. <laughs> so tell us what else you do on those retreats, then, mate. Obviously, they're they're exclusive to men. Is that right? I think. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about what a typical retreat might look like. So there's a lot. Of it, a lot of it depends on the time of year and, and where and where with the venue. So obviously, we're by the coast. We'll we'll surf as well. But say typical. It's heavily based around like breath breath work. I like use like how the breath can kind of like assist us in life. Uh, my friend who runs it with me, Josh, he, he does the yoga. So it'd be like breath work, yoga, jujitsu, my coach Nick comes on to a lot of them. If it's like within uh, distance, he'll come. Um, if it's the right time of year, we'll go foraging, forage like mushrooms and cook them. <laughs> or like we will open fire cooking in the forest. Um, we do sometimes, we, a friend of ours who, who came on a retreat, he, he'll, he's, he'll come on, he'll we'll do like spoon carving. It sounds a bit random, but it's what, such, spoon carving. Okay. So it's such, you're out in, the, in nature, you kind of like, people just whittling for hours and guys just like don't even have like a thought because they're so like immersed in it. Um, yeah, I'll just run like general fitness sessions. Um, yeah, med- meditation and different style, different styles of breath work. Uh, if there's a pool there, we'll do the pool. We'll do the pool training. So all, all different, obviously a lot of hiking. Um, we'll try to get more, some more kind of like creative things on uh, on there on there as well. So you got the physical bits. All you want stuff that's like more um, like in, in in yeah like, like prompts like creativity. So we had a woman come on and we we foraged and then we made like a winter balm. It's, it sounds random, but it's just exposing people to different things they wouldn't usually do. And obviously it's heavily focused around like the evenings where you have like five circles and we'll kind of go around and not in like you've not got this long and it's not it's not forced like that because there's a lot of that out there but it's just like a genuine conversation and like uh, it's an opportunity to kind of 
be vulnerable if that's what you want. If, if things are amazing in your life and you want to talk about how great things are, please. Like it's not we're not there to be like to be yeah. victims, you know, we're not there how how hard life is. It's like just what's what what's going on. Mm. And you'd be surprised what kind of will come up and like what they'll say to a group of people they don't know opposed to what they've said to the wife and, and the best friends because they don't feel like they can they can do that. It's a place to like drop the guard and just kind of be I, I like to see the retreats as a preventative measure for men. So it's like don't wait till it's too late, don't wait till it's burnt out till like you're really struggling. Take that time for yourself, kind of drop the drop the role of the provider, etc. and just like just be and have things taken care of for you, do these different practices, take time to reflect. So we have a bit of space in between the activities and that's the time to like journal just to kind of be with with yourself and like what's going on am I where I want to be in life where, am I like aligning with like the right purpose this kind of stuff so we give we basically we, we just create the container like they do it themselves and like the group and stuff like that so yeah and trying to like just trying to be like real grounded as well not very like woo obviously it does look a bit woo but trying to like I want it to be normal do you know what I mean I want I really want it to like still some people might still look at and think oh it's a men's retreat like I want it to be normal for like, a man to prioritize going on a three four day retreat just to prioritize their own physical yeah. mental health opposed maybe going better than for four days <laughs> and getting you know I so yeah. I, and they're coming back feeling like not saying that's not do that as well but like when what's more beneficial for you at that time in your life you know something yeah yeah mate it sounds it sounds great mate and you touched on a few things there you used a few words like sort of purpose provider i wanted to just to, to get your take because obviously you're in this space you you work a lot around men's wellness and you obviously have exposure to a lot of men at these retreats like what, what do you think men are struggling so much at the moment it's a good question and i'm I sit in these circles every time and I'm like kind of really, because I'm trying to really trying to be there and like I'm not just waiting. I'll open the circles sometimes, but even if, if I didn't and Josh did, I'm not trying to wait for my turn to speak. I'm really trying to kind of like engage with everyone, like giving me, me full attention. And what, there's a theme and the, the, the theme is they are coming to, a lot of the guys are coming to be they want to improve they want they want to improve and then they want to be the best versions of themselves and they just feel they've kind of slipped into different habits and patterns that aren't, aren't the best for them and they really just want to kind of jig it up and like and need to shake, shake the global a snow globe almost and kind of step away from that create a bit of space to see and then come back and step in and be a bit more like purposeful of what they're doing Sometimes it'd be people with divorce and like they're at a point in the life where they're just feeling a bit lost, just feeling a bit lost and kind of like don't really don't really know what uh, what it is they want to do next. So they're using it as like a point, a pivot point to come and like take stock and like okay, I need to what what they actually want to do. And because in, 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 if you're in your day to day, if if you're in your day to day routine, it's hard for you to kind of do that because you're kind of just following the same pattern all the time. So, um, yeah, they're coming for space essentially to kind of work out the next, the next steps. Um, but I am seeing a lot of like, a lot of the, a lot of depression, a lot of men with depression. And like, we're not therapists, you know, these are also, they're already seeing therapists. Um, we're just kind of like holding space for kind of what it is, what, what is that's going on for them. So yeah, and it, it's sad, like the guys are struggling, like you see it, a lot of guys, are got, but they want to, the general theme is they want to be better. And that's what. I really, I, I wouldn't like it if they come in and just blaming other people. I, I really want people to take accountability because like, they're all, and then people can hold you accountable then. So yeah, it's not like a Andrew Tate kind of like women suck, like, you know, like we're <laughs> men, like we're, we're men have got it so hard, yeah. like, um, because like men, men have a hard role they, they have to play and, and we have to, we have to hold a lot, but um if it's so women, you know, what I mean? you know what I mean. So it's not like we're vic we're not victims, but it's like okay, what's going on? How can we how can we take accountability? How can we be the best version of ourselves so we can then be better for those around us, like our our partners? How can we be better fathers, be better sons? You know, so it's just like a space to kind of work. With. And I'm, by the way, I'm not like telling people. <laughs> I'm not saying this is how it is to be like a better man. I'm just we just create like circles for this conversation. We we put on the activities and I allow it and allow it to come up. Yeah, it's, it's yes, it's a it's a it's a tough one, isn't it? And we've had you know quite a few conversations on this podcast about it, and you know we've spoken to a guy from Andy's Man Club, and then talking about the power of conversation and yeah. how how important that is for guys to have that space, and obviously you have that as well with your circle. We had um, we had a couple of doctors on who specialise in in men's health and and hormones, and yes. and talked about the fact that testosterone deficiency can lead to 
depression and lower mood and social withdrawal. And that's sometimes a bit of a, uh, a tricky spot because if guys are maybe struggling hormonally, they won't want to go and talk because they, they this is the last thing they want to do, right? Because yeah. they, they socially withdraw. Um, and I guess with some of the, uh, just on a slight tangent here, just on that note, from like a hormonal perspective, like testosterone, is, is any of the stuff that breath work, co or what, does that, does that contribute to sort of positive movements in, in male hormones are you aware of? Not sure about I'm not sure about the breath, but I think uh, I think the cold. From, yeah. I think, yeah, I'm not I'm not quite sure I'm not quite sure actually. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to say the wrong. I'd hate to say the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, I think the cold. I think there is something in the cold in, in the cold with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I'll have to do a bit more digging. Yeah, that's fine. And you kind of talked a lot there about how men kind of I guess are looking to improve, and and sadly, so many men obviously get to a point where they just can't find a solution. Um, and and take their own lives. And do you, do you kind of your perspective of it? Do you think it is that they just don't they can't see that solution and they they can't find like a, a sort of route to improve? Is that is that partly why they you think they get to that point? Because we also spoke to a guy called uh, George from the the Tin Men, which is um, a kind of online blog. But he talks a lot about sort of gender equality and and he talks about societal pressures for men. Um, and he you know he feels that that decision to, to take your own life is often just an extreme version of solving a problem that they otherwise can't figure out a solution to. Interesting. I think, I think a lot of it comes from just the, the inability to kind of uh, like exp express ourselves probably properly just because of the way um, the stigma around, around, um, around men so i think the the biggest driver driver of of shame in men is feeling weak mm -hmm. so if they i think that research suggests that so i feel when we feel um if we feel if we feel weak we're, we, we feel we feel ashamed yeah, it's like, like vulnerability you know, yeah exactly like, you don't then, like it if they, again i used to hate i used to hate feeling vulnerable it just it just didn't feel good it just didn't so and i used to associate with weakness then anything that associate with weakness i'll push it away so i think guys do i think we just keep we keep pushing until uh, we just can't push. We just can't hold it in anymore. I, th I think it just. I think it just comes up. Where so I'm really passionate about kind of trying to put it, talk about emotion in a different lens and how it just what it is. Just a bodily experience. Um, but yeah, I think I think the shame of of like feeling weak and um, maybe what not having like a really clear definition of what it looks like what does it look like to be a good man like, yeah I, I well, it's, it's definitely blurred lines these days isn't it mm. what is a what is a man you know yeah. we're getting pulled which, whichever way you know yeah. if you if you're masculine you're too masculine you're a fucking you know you hate, hate women you hate this you hate that and it is it's blurred isn't it you know there's no real purpose that that's what it feels like there's no real clear line where to go i think more information around masculinity like more conversation around masculinity is is, is important because I think like, everyone talks about toxic masculinity, which I don't really enjoy. Um, because ma masculinity in itself isn't toxic. Really. We're just uh, we're just tying a, a toxic brush to it. So I think for me, like what the what are the good traits of of the masculine, I'd say kind of being like integral, being like being supportive for those around us, being like purposeful, um, with like with you with your direction. I feel like they're really good. I think I think the masculine can be like shepherds, like a shepherd of of the community. I think that they're the kind of really positive forms of masculinity. There's probably more like uh, sub aspects of the more kind of like uh, overbearing, like hyper dominant, you know that kind. Because mm -hmm. that's not that's not strength, is it? Like I'm opposing your will of will over someone. I feel like uh, being a bigger measure of strength is kind of like internal strength. How much can you take? Like how much can you bear without kind of like giving in? Um, can you do the right thing if uh, among others kind of? giving you giving you shit essentially but can you stick to your morals like you obviously even if it means kind of like stepping away from people because it, it doesn't serve you that's the kind of strength that i that i value you know yeah i completely agree mate and i think you mentioned there about you know how guys if they kind of feel weak they feel ashamed yeah and another thing that that the guy from the tin men said was that statistics show that a lot of guys who who take their life by suicide often have sought help as well um, so many of them do ask for help, but I think part of the issue is that sometimes the the kind of response that they get or the treatment they get is is maybe tailored more towards females, where it's very much like you know a sort of hug and a wrap your arms around them and make them feel okay. Where actually, what you say, as you say, they're looking for a bit of a solution and, and looking to feel better. And I think that's is where your retreats sound amazing because 
you're not necessarily doing that. You're giving them a bit of accountability, but giving them self improvement. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of fun though, a bit of, yeah, bit of yeah. male bonding. You know, like you said, it's it's hard to talk to people, isn't it? It's hard to talk to someone that you're close to, your your wife, anyone like that, that saying, oh, I'm feeling shit or I'm feeling like I'm lacking purpose or I want to change career or I want to do this because we're all pretty much stuck in this rat race of just bills and, you know, you could be in an office job and you think, fuck me, I used to be a, a PT. I used to, you know, I used to play rugby. I used to do this, I used to do that. And now I'm stuck in a fucking, an office doing a job I hate because I've got kids, I've got a mortgage, I've got all these things. And I think that's where a lot of blokes, we, we really do, we do struggle with that because we don't really want that. We want to, sometimes we want to just be out fucking around. We want to be having, doing jujitsu. We want to be doing all those things that are kind of natural to us. And I feel sometimes we're taking really so far out of our natural comfort zone and having to do shit that really we just never want to fucking do. Male postnatal depression, mate. It's a thing, you. mate. Yeah, it's yeah. a fucking hundred percent. Yeah, I did a little post about that recently, and, and spoke to a friend. I saw her at a conference where a guy was talking about it, um, and I spoke to a friend about it and asked him if he experienced sort of postnatal male depression, and he said no. But I almost got like a period of mourning where, like, I now was transitioning from my old life as a carefree guy who I could risk take and you know and, and kind of be fully accountable for my own time whereas now i've got to be a bit more responsible i can't take the same risks i've got a person to be responsible for yeah. it's, so it's a transition for a guy i think at times yeah i think especially if you if you go through that transition when you're when you're older mm -hmm. like i i had my son fairly young and to be honest i just didn't have time to think about it i didn't even know my own fucking thoughts at that point you know 22 23 but i think if i didn't have my son as young as i did and i had him now mm -hmm. i think you'd be like fuck i'm giving up a lot of like freedom and giving up a lot of, you know you'd, you'd think about those sort of things more mm. whereas i think when i was young i was just like yeah fuck it, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it you know and uh just get on with it yeah did i hear that you uh you, you found yourself at a retreat with russell brand at some point as well so <laughs> did you? it wasn't a, it wasn't a retreat so it was it was his festival okay um and i I was on a panel with him and a few other guys kind of talking about like masculinity in the modern day. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, uh, <laughs> I got asked to go on that and that was, that was interesting. That was, that was you know, you know, seeing what he's like, he, um, just, yeah, he was, he was like, cause it was funny cause he was like, he was like serious topics, but then he just kind of make a joke out of it. And like, um, it was, it was, it was really funny. So yeah, it was, in, it was interesting seeing someone like with his kind of like the way he can like articulate sentences and stuff and stuff like that. Yeah. He's a very clever guy, isn't he? He comes across. He comes. He, he gives comes, that impression. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he comes across in the way he wants to come across, which is quite a hard thing to do, isn't it? You know. Yeah. It's very thoughtful in what he says, but he's very quick at it. Did you get a chance to roll with him or anything? No, there was jujitsu there, but I didn't. I didn't see him. Yeah, he took a liking to me though. He, uh, Did he? Yeah. Yeah. He was like, <laughs> I see the hair, kept, right? kept telling everyone he, fan he fancied me <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> on, on the stage on the stage that night. Uh, he was like, there's obviously something like the whole uh, thing was there. He was, talk he was talking about the day. He's like, oh, I've had my heterosexuality question today. He's like, Anthony Mullally drives me do lally. <laughs> 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 I was just in the crowd like, oh, oh God. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was funny. So obviously, that was before that kind of stuff went, went, went down. But yeah, um, it's a different conversation, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Mate, where can people find these of your retreats and the work you do if they want to reach out? So... If you go on Instagram, my Instagram is Malali, um, all the L's, M-U-L-L-A-L-L-Y-91. And the both sides uh, is obviously both sides of treats. And the website is both sides of treats.com. You can obviously, we've got, we got the list of, we, we, uh, we, we've got a few on now. So you, the list of the retreats is on, is on the website. And uh, yeah, that's the two best places to kind of reach out regarding that. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Let's leave it there, shall we? Yeah, that's amazing, mate. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers, guys.